we now come to, uh, to some discussion, and I get one of the questions that's um, been raised that I think you've already touched on, Anne, is um, the rollout uh, to areas across Australia. Um, so could I just ask yeah. you to revisit the slide you we covered where um, the first dates that will sure. be covered and the rollout plan? So the, um, earlier this year, we advertised grants to establish specialist dementia care uh, program units in within 12, prim 12 primary health network regions. Um, we already had the, um, the service in Perth that had already been announced and, and um, has, has now commenced operation. And of course, we have the Caulfield and Cardiff units. Another um, unit has previously been announced by Minister Wyatt uh, for Adelaide, which will be um, opening at the at the old Repat Hospital, but not until 2021. So in terms of the, um, the, the competitive round, this time we've selected uh, seven providers to establish units within the states. Now, I think all states will have at least one specialist dementia care unit with the exception of Tasmania and Northern Territory. You've just answered my other <laughs> question. <laughs> Um, so we will be looking, uh, we, we already have started the process of looking at why we did not receive applications within those states and the capacity for the sector to, to establish a specialist dementia care program within those states. So that's an ongoing uh, piece of work for us to do. Um, the schedule for rollout otherwise is that in 2021 we will advertise a uh, phase two uh, grant round which will cover all of the primary health networks that were not filled in, in phase one. So the intention is absolutely so, a national program? Absolutely, yes. Uh, Steve, you touched in the, the uh, client uh, who was ineligible um, that he'd had surgery, if I picked up right. Can you maybe uh, mention the impact at some times of um, general anaesthetics on people's uh, cognition? Because uh, delirium can, as I understand it, uh, be caused sometimes by uh, GAAs? Yes, certainly people who are cognitively vulnerable uh, who already have a diagnosis of dementia, for example, general anaesthetics can uh, make things much worse. I think in uh, Zhang Wei's case, he'd had a respiratory infection and landed in intensive care. I, I may be wrong on that, but uh, certainly any condition that causes uh, delirium can be associated with a significant peak in behaviours. Uh, and again, to emphasise that SDCP is not, not for people with delirium because... Uh, the idea with delirium and the expectation of somebody whose behaviours escalate in the setting of a delirium is that when the delirium settles, the behaviours will settle as well. So it underlines my point about two weeks of problem behaviour, even if that behaviour is very severe and there's a clear diagnosis of dementia, if it's a short history, the priority is to exclude a delirium and to manage that. Once the delirium is managed, we'd expect that the behaviours would settle as well. Currently, about 15% of cases that DSA see uh, have dementia, uh, sorry, have delirium as a contributing factor to the behaviours. So, uh, Sue Hyde's asked, um, is there an age criteria, Anne, for, for, for the program, eligibility? No, there's not. And um, Steve, um, you touched on the um, uh, staff that you're working with at the moment um, as assessors. One of the questions that's come in from Simon Beggs is, who is eligible to be an assessor and what competencies are, are required to forge a career in that sort of area? Oh, well, uh, look for the uh, employment section on the DSA website, I think, would be the, the first uh, point to emphasise. Our, our dementia consultants who will be conducting the eligibility assessments uh, have been working for DSA in a consultant capacity for some time, managing DB mass and SBR2 level cases. We're prioritising... Uh, training up our SBRT consultants currently to become SDCP assessors. So currently, to answer the question, you can't become an SDCP assessor unless you have already been a dementia consultant working within DSA. That may change again as the program evolves and matures and more units come online because strictly the, the skills and competencies required of an assessor might be somewhat different to... Uh, a dementia consultant whose brief is to go and manage the behaviours. The, the assessment skill set is complementary, but there's, there's not a complete overlap. Uh, 
So that may change. Our consultants are being trained in how to use our validated eligibility assessment tools. So when they're visiting referrers, they will be assessing documentation against fairly strict predefined criteria to uh, determine that those criteria are met. We could technically train up anybody to become an SDCP assessor, but because DSA has the, uh, the imprimatur to do the assessments, we're restricted to training up our own staff to do that at the moment. And um, uh, it's tempting not to answer some of these questions myself, but uh, obviously we have an accreditation of consultants who work within the DSA program, um, and it's, it's worth uh, letting people know that uh, there, there were pilots with Blue Care and Catholic Homes as part of extending that out to other providers, and that's something certainly that might over time um, create the pathways. But in terms of professions, um, uh, what, what are the professions of the types of consultants that we have? Oh, you're taxing my memory. Oh. I know we've, we have all of the allied health and nursing professions represented from memory, and you might correct me on this, Colm, around 50% of our workforce are nursing backgrounds, whether it's aged care nurses or aged psychiatry nurses. The remainder are a, an assortment of occupational therapists, social workers, we have dietitians, we have physiotherapists on the team, we have psychologists, we've had neuropsychologists in the past. And quite, a, quite aside from the dementia consultant role, we also have our medical specialists who are primarily geriatricians and old age psychiatrists. And I guess that, uh, that role of assessor is assigned to the geriatricians and psychiatrists as well because we have the ultimate oversight of the assessment documentation that's produced to provide that clinical uh, overview and the, the gold standard of a medical assessment, as I like to put it. Well, and I'm sorry, I sort of uh, made uh, Steve sweat a little bit there because obviously he will have to go back and face all the professions uh, in the team um, if he's missed anybody. But, but I think you did a good job there of covering most of the professions who are in. And you're right, it's, it's, it's over 50% are nurses, but you, you, you did well there.